Okay, we're live. Hello, everybody. I'm Valkyria Montemor. Sua pesquisa gerou o seguinte resultado. Vou ter que começar. Hello, everybody. I'm Valkyria Montemor from the University of São Paulo, Brazil. I'm very, very glad to introduce to you colleagues uh, that join, that integrate the nationwide project on literacies that is coordinated by me and my colleague, Lynn Mario Menezes de Souza. Uh, all of them are going to uh, show what they've been doing in terms of research in Brazil and why they are considered innovative as well. So you're going to listen to Daniel de Mello Ferraz from the University of Sao Paulo, my colleague from same university. Um, later, uh, next then you're going to listen to both Laudo Natel do Nascimento from the Federal University of Alagoas and also from the University of Sao Paulo, uh, his uh, PhD student of mine. So uh, together with him, you're going to uh, follow Ana Karina de Oliveira Nascimento from the Federal University of Sergipe. Then next, you're going to have a, a different experience with uh, Clarissa Jordão, Simone Batista, Leina Jucá, and Luciana Ferrari. They come from different federal universities in, in Brazil. Clarissa from Paraná, uh, Simone from Rio de Janeiro, Leida Jucá from uh, Minas Gerais, and Lu Luciana Ferrari from Espírito Santo. But uh, I better show you uh, where they come from in this map. This is the map uh, that shows our nationwide project on literacies, uh, language, culture, education, and technology. Uh, the one that I said that is directed by me and by my colleague, Lynn Mario. And here you're going to you find the 34 universities that integrate our uh, project, right? So I've, uh, I've uh, uh, highlighted the universities uh, these participants, uh, the ones that are going to present research, come from, right? So you see that one comes from this region here, right? This is the Federal University of, of Sergipe. So uh, we have a, a, another a researcher from the rural uh, University of Rio de Janeiro. So it's a federal university as well. This one here is from uh, Minas Gerais. So you, you see different places here, uh, USP, Okay, that, that is the, the university that hosts the project. Um, however, not, uh, okay, on a network mode and also from the Federal University of Paraná here on the map, okay? So uh, the, the colloquium aims to discuss innovative educational projects and research produced in Brazil in terms of their potential for social and academic transformations. Uh, we hope you all enjoy uh, their presentations and their uh, research and their proposals. And uh, at the end, we hope that you also leave uh, questions and comments on that, right? So thank you very much for your attention. Now, um, we are going to listen to Professor Daniel Ferraz from uh, a colleague of mine from the University of Sao Paulo. Okay, hello, Daniel. Hi, Valkyria. Um, hello, Clarissa. Hello, Ana Karina. Hello, Laudo. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to share this colloquium with you guys. So let's start. Uh, Karina, can you uh, please? Yeah, okay, thank you. So the title of my presentation, I just inverted, inverted our, our main title. And the title is Pandemic Current Hard Times and Literacies in Brazil. And I inverted for a political reason, because as everybody knows, uh, we've been facing very difficult pandemic uh, times in Brazil because of so many reasons. It's very complex to try to understand, but as I'm gonna show you, I'll try to, to bring my perspectives. Uh, Karina, can you move on to the next slide? Yes, thank you. So this very brief presentation is based 
uh, on two research projects I carried on with colleagues. This one with two colleagues from the Spanish uh, um, language uh, field, and uh, the other one from uh, the French. So Monica Marinke and Eloisa. Albuquerque Costa, the construction of a new remote language teaching experience in the pandemic context at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. This is to be published this, uh, this year. And the second one, um, educating in, pandemic, in times of pandemic, images as micropolitics of epistemic disobedience to the modern and humanist, uh, humanist epistemologies of the global north. And this one, Karina, the next one, sorry. <laughs> And, the, and this one, this is the paper I've just read. Uh, this one I wrote with Susanna Misa, okay? So based on these two research projects that I carried out with colleagues, I will uh, continue my presentation. So next slide, please. Thank you. So all of a sudden, humanity is experiencing a health crisis, which is not a new reality for humans, who have already gone through polio, cholera, black plague, and other pests. But this one is unprecedented for the absolute majority of the current inhabitants of the earth. Uh, the next slide, please. Science, so despised by Brazilian education ministers, uh, flat earthers and neg negationists on duty has mobilized itself as never before reinforcing in this period of health crisis the important role of scientific research. Next, please. The impact of the global health crisis caused by COVID-19 has had overwhelming effects on many dimensions of human life, such as the economic, social, and psychological dimensions. Uh, just as an example, many of our students have lost their jobs, um, a lot have suffered from social isolation and witnessed thousands of deaths. And of course, as you can see in these two images, <clears throat> uh, the educational field has not been an exception, given that the sudden change from traditional face-to-face -face teaching to remote online emergency teaching has profoundly altered the personal daily lives of students, teachers, administrative staff, faculties, and other and, and the educational institutions. So you can see here the enormous, the huge gap that we see in many of the contexts uh, in Brazil. And then um, talking about crisis before, during, and after the pandemic, here I, I bring Sousa Santos ideas from the 2020, A Cruel Pedagogia do Virus, the Cruel Pedagogy of the Virus, in which he ta he's talking about this idea that the pandemic crisis is happening now, but we have some other bigger crisis that we have to deal before, during, and probably after the pandemic, which are the capitalism, the colon colonialism, and patriarchy. So um, there are also invisible or neglected crises happening here in Brazil. The first one, the, for example, the rupture of the dam in Brumadinho that buried uh, 270 human lives under the sea of toxic, uh, toxic mud. Um, and in 2019, the rupture of the dam in Mariana and its mud reaching the river, uh, river Doce in Brazil, whose water supply many riverside and native populations um, in the banks of, uh, around the banks of the river. And also the current uh, government's constant disregard for the devastation of the Amazon forest. So all of this poses a threat, not only to the people, but also to, to the forest. Well, Brazil stands as a very atypical, unique case in the middle of this. The government, moreover the president, has encouraged more crisis within the Brazilian society. You can, uh, Karina, help me with the, with the images. So um, a hate speech about difference, the revival of the idea of denying science, the next one, a resistance to the need of environmental pres preservation. Uh, next image, please. This one. So you see down there, the water coming, going up, and I don't believe in global warming. And the last image, 
refers to the legit legitimation of a necropolitics by the president. So over there, he's saying in Portuguese, e daí? In, in English, so what? Uh, a lot of people are dying, so what? I don't care. Um, I'll, I'll keep there just a little bit more, Karina, thank you. It is obvious that, at least to me, the president is just one very bad pawn in the very corrupt political game of chess in Brazil. Next image, please. The Chamber of Senators uh, and the, on the owners of the main media, the big entrepreneurs, so all of this belongs to this uh, game of chess. So according to Duboc and, Fer and Ferraz, 2018, uh, like in many other countries in the world, Brazil has sadly witnessed the revival of uh, next effect, Karina, thank you. <laughs> yes, so Brazil has witnessed the revival of outright movements, homogeneity, consensus, standardization, universalism, passivity, militarization, and authoritarianism. So you see from the images there, the first one is the son of the president claiming dictatorship to be back. One God is the trend now, one truth, and the militarization of school. So very difficult and complex situations that the Brazilians have been facing. Uh, so moving on to the education in Brazil then, um, it is essential, it, it's essential to restate that we are in the middle, in the middle of a pandemic and that the difficulties our students, especially the unprivileged ones, uh, face need to be problematized by the, everyone involved. So here, uh, next image, please. Yeah. So here I, I have a, cit a, a citation from Williamson, and they bring something very interesting for us to think about. Certain actors in the... Uh, go, uh, go back, Karina, sorry. Yeah, certain actors in the educational technology industry are treating the crisis as a business opportunity with potentially long-term consequences for how public education is perceived and practiced long after the coronavirus has been brought under control. So the markets, they have always been central in, in education, especially for neoliberal education. But this, with the pandemic, many people are taking advantage of this. And the issues of inclusion, as you can see here, uh, with the image of the, of the left, uh, and uh, exclusion and inclusion is, is a big uh, conversation we have to make as educators. So next slide, please. So under, um, under the motto, the University of Sao Paulo cannot stop. Professors and students were taken aback as most undergraduate and graduate courses were practically forced to become virtual and online courses. Practically overnight, professors and students had to find ways to negotiate all aspects of higher education. And this situation raised some questions related to the topics. For example, the contents. Would the contents be the same as initially planned in face-to-face -face education? Interaction. If professors and students were used to interacting in classes, what kinds of interaction would remote teaching promote? Assessment, evaluation. How would evaluation be in the digital con this new digital context? Technology, um, knowledge, and expertise. So were professors and students tech savvy enough to adapt to this new technological reality? And finally, uh, next images, Karina, thank you. The, both images, not to mention the number of students who ended up with depression and anxiety during the process of adap adaptation to remote teaching. So my, uh, my last question is, how would we deal with professors and students' anxieties and depression? Next slide, please. So in relation to uh, the local practices during the pandemic, I would like to share some, some of the activities that have been done. Uh, so I discussed the syllabus and the content of the courses with the students since the first weeks of classes. As the pandemic hit us, the negotiation was transferred to online settings. And just another example in terms of assessment. Uh, Karina, can you move on to the next slide, please? Just for me to check. Let me see. Um, yes, this one. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
Yes, this this image. So this is my university, University of São Paulo. Um, well, the university I work <laughs> at. Uh, assessment. So in addition, the assessment system was discussed and adapted to the pandemic times as we went. So my, my, my students and, and, and our, me and the students, we went through a very interesting evaluation experience. So I, I scheduled online meetings through Google Meet outside the class hours. And in the meetings, we discussed new forms of assessment and we showed uh, for each group and uh, how the students would, would like to be assessed individually. It was a very interesting experience that I think I should have, be, I should have done before the pandemic. So it was a big learning for me. So they decided on response papers, shorter papers, video recordings, assessment activities, and interviews with the professor. So and each, each student they could, they could also work in pairs, for example. So they could choose throughout the process how they would like to be evaluated. Next slide, please. Um, assessment negotiation is just one of the many examples of the adaptation to remote language teaching. We also talked during the meetings and every time I started a class and I finished the class, and here I'm talking about the undergraduate level, also the graduate level. We also talked about the difficulties brought by the lack of access or slow internet connection, the lack of interaction in classes, like in digital settings. We discussed the lecture-like, classes like lecture, and their consequences in terms of the impact on the, um, on the learning process in digital settings the choice of pedagogical practices, the methodologies for remote education, and the fact that many students, again, felt depressed, depressed and anxious in relation to the COVID pandemic, isolation, and mandatory remote education. So I, the key thing for me has been negotiation and dialogue, something very old. Uh, Paulo Freire talked about this. You cannot start a class, get into a classroom without get, trying to get to know the context, trying to get to know your students, but I think this becomes even bigger and necessary in remote settings. So I'm, I'm uh, moving on to my conclusion. Um, I think the literacy's contribution to all this, uh, the next slide, Karina, and uh, you can, as I read, you can bring together along with me. And thank you very much, Karina. So what, what I think literacies can do now for us to understand all this is to problematize other views of language, insist uh, on the inclusion of, of themes such as race, gender, sexualities, class, politics, and technologies, also technologies in the educational agenda. So what I'm proposing here is that we do things we've, we've done before, but with the challenge of the remote emergency teaching. Design teacher education based upon literacies uh, with epistemological and, and ontological proposals, as well as pedagogical practices. An example would be this multiliteracies made in Brazil that we've been trying to problematize. And by defending language as a social practice, the literacies educator can choose to discuss the political educational dismantling especially that of the national public universities in Brazil and the attack being carried out on professionals and researchers in the fields of humanities, anthropology, sociology, philosophy, and also us from the languages. Um, I think this is it. I thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm open for comments and questions if you want to know more of the things I've been doing. Um, I'm very open to questions and comments in the chats in the follow-up of the event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for your insightful presentation. Um, now, I'd like you to. Uh, I'd like. To, I'd like to introduce Ana Karina uh, de Oliveira Nascimento and Laudo Nascimento to you. Uh, as I said, they, they, they are both from uh, federal universities, one from Sergipe and the other one from uh, Alagoas, right? And uh, Laudo is also a PhD uh, researcher at the University of Sao Paulo. 
So thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave you now with Karina and Laudu. Thank you, Valkyria. So we are going to, I'm going to present, okay, in, the, in the, our presentation we have the audio as well. Karina, I think you have to go back and check and the share unmute. audio. Now she has to unmute. Sorry. Okay, let me start. Yes. Again. Yeah. And Valkyria has to mute her microphone because of yes. Um, thank I you. can do that. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Like, let's go back. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are Laud Natel. Uh, we are glad to be here at the Colloquium Literacy Education in Brazilian Political and Pandemic Current Hard Times. Our presentation is Being an English Teacher in Pandemic Times in Sergipe, Brazil. Uh, we speak from Aracaju, Sergipe, the smallest state in Brazil, uh, and we are near Salvador and Recife. Uh, we speak from we speak about uh, or from different perspectives. Uh, in my case, I am a professor at the Federal University of Alagoas, and I am a PhD candidate at USP. Um, and I am a professor at the Federal University of Sergipe, and we are both connected through Link, which is our research group that is also connected to the Brazilian National Teacher Education Project uh, that Valkyria talked about. And this study is one of the outcomes of LINK. Uh, so let's talk about the pandemic in Brazil. Uh, so uh, last year in March, to be precise, in March 18th, no more on-site classes in Sergipe were allowed. Only at the end of 2020, hybrid classes for high school senior students were allowed. Uh, and at the beginning of 2021, on-site classes for all levels in private schools. But after March 2021, only online classes for all levels and schools. Due to, due to the aggravation of COVID-19 in, in our state. So, what has been an English teaching pandemic times decision in Brazil? So, this research. Uh, it originally aimed at understanding how teachers have been dealing with the new literacies in their pedagogical practices. It's, uh, um, the research follows a qualitative interpretive approach. And the participants focused uh, were public school English teachers and the data collection uh, involved. involved three items. Uh, a questionnaire with 18 respondents, uh, an interview with 88 respondents, and a focal group with six participants. The meetings were held on Saturdays using Google Meet. The interviews and focal group took place during the pandemic. And that is one of the reasons why we are talking about um, being an English teacher in pandemic times in Sergipe um, based on the data collected through this research, which initially was not aimed at discussing the epidemic, but due to the current you know, crisis, um, we also have data about that. The theoretical framework. So we used the theories of Noble and Shear. Uh, new literacy and digital literacies, 
uh, the concepts of e-learning affordances by Cope and Calensis and the multimodality uh, from Kress, Jewett and Zaki. So in order to um, analyze the data we have, we um, chose here to talk about five different topics which emerged uh, through data analysis. The first one we called on-site versus remote learning. And it is about how um, teachers um, talked about, viewed um, the difference between on-site and remote learning uh, during this pandemic time. So this teacher, for example, during the focal group in March this year, uh, he mentions that remote education, he never thought of remote education as, as replacing face-to-face -face teaching. He was always thinking about as a way of reducing the losses due to a number of reasons, such as space reasons, because students do not have um, a good space at home to study, food issues, because some teachers, some students, they go to school in order to eat, and also technological access. And then he concludes by saying that this pandemic, it deepened, opened up problems that already existed. Such, such as social, economic, and political ones. So this connects to what uh, Boventura Souza Santos uh, said uh, uh, on the book uh, A Cruel Pedagogy of the Virus. He said, the invisibility zones could multiply in many other regions of the world and maybe even here, very close to each one of us. And he also said, since the 1980s, uh, as neoliberalism has been imposing itself as the dominant version of capitalism, and it has been subjecting itself more and more to the logic of the financial sector, the world has lived in a permanent state of crisis. And that's exactly what what this teacher and some other teachers will bring in just one example of each talk, right? So this is exactly what teachers mentioned during our research. The second topic is called dealing with, we call it dealing with technology in pandemic times and how for some of them it was a burden. So this teacher, for example, uh, Ayuton, he mentions that, by the way, these are not their real names. Uh, he mentions that he didn't start from the scratch when the pandemic started. And he's talking about tools, uh, technological tools. And then he mentions that his biggest difficulty was not to learn to use these resources or to adapt them to class, but the contextual issues of these schools where he works. So that pretty much connects to the first topic. But then he also he, he focuses on the fact that um, when one technology is learned by the teacher and the teacher feels comfortable, there is another new one. So it's like the teacher's practices and leaders are not taken into account. Um, and this is very complicated according to him because then it's like a burden that you have to learn something new all the time. So about something new all the time, uh, Alvin and Vieira said the myriad of options can sometimes generate the opposite effect, becoming a source of anxiety about which tools to select the necessary support. So um, that's exactly what the teacher, um, as he mentioned, and that's exactly how he felt. Then, the third topic relates to getting prepared for the unexpected. And I, we have here a quote of a very famous Brazilian song, which says that last year I died, but this year I don't die anymore, or something like that. And this teacher, um, he mentions that uh, he was really worried, this was February 2021, so public schools were about to start in March 2021 in a hybrid mode. And he mentions that this idea, this new reality of hybrid education, it was really challenging. And he says that it's like last year, he, he, had, he really died, that old me had died. And it, because it was very challenging, really challenging, and he had to be reborn, like in, 
impulse, like he didn't have time to get prepared to it, it was why you're doing it. So, uh, and now he was facing a different and new challenge, which was be, to be both in classroom, like on site, and also having students uh, studying remotely, so teaching two groups like at the same time. So this was like, I'm going to die again and be reborn one more time. So about that, uh, we have been doing some research here as a um, research group. And in one of the recent texts which we published, we said, it is essential to prepare teachers for the uncertain, the unpredictable, the unexpected. Since humanity follows its course towards not the guaranteed path of progress, but that of uncertainty, making it necessary to prepare for our uncertain world and await the unexpected. So, more than competence, it is performativity that takes the central role, which depends on the different peculiar contexts that will be encountered. So, one of the things we have been discussing and doing research on is the importance of preparing our teachers, so um, our pre-service teachers, to deal with the unexpected. And the pandemic was one example of those possible. Uh, another topic that we came across through data was uh, the idea of reinventing themselves as teachers. So uh, Mark was in, in, in the interview last year, so at the very beginning of the pandemic, he mentioned that technology was a very important tool, but he had to reinvent himself. So reinvent the teaching process, the methodology, and he reflects upon the fact that he was he went to one of his classes, online classes, and he had only three participants. And then he questions himself, am I reaching my goal? So um, he mentions then that he needs new strategies to reinvent his classroom. And that wouldn't happen six days in a month, two, three, maybe not in a semester because everything was really new. And then uh, another teacher called Marilene during the interview also, she mentioned an activity that she proposed to her high school students. Anyway, she asked some questions and uh, also asked them to write a sentence saying how they were feeling during that period. And she came across something that she thought it was unexpected, um, but that one of the students said that she missed, she missed the face-to-face -face contact. And then uh, all her, her conversation with us during the interview was about when they were having on-site classes, uh, students would always be, be asking them, asking the teachers to have digital activities. Now they were only, uh, classes were only taking place through the digital format, they were missing face to face. So um, um, some authors have talked about that ideas. And for example, Hondini, he mentions that it was identified that despite difficulties in transposing face to face teaching to the remote modality and in the use of technology, teachers point out how challenging and enriching the pandemic moments is for the practice making the process of teacher reinvention something possible. And also about what the teacher said, the last one, uh, Alvin mentions that the abrupt shift into remote instruction caused a loss to the benefits of daily exchanges, exchanges as the limitations of interactivity by video camera conferences impose a much smaller amount of time of social contact and performance. And this, is, this is something that this teacher uh, realized both teachers that right, through their um, um, this te uh, so this teacher also mentions um, the idea of um, when reinventing herself uh, and thinking about new practices that she had to expand her knowledge and this was possible through courses but that what she thought it helped her a lot was to work collaboratively uh, with her co-workers so that um, they would learn from each other. And she says, 
and I quote, and we ended up learning a lot in this process. And this connects to the idea of collaborative intelligence, which is part of Cope Calentes' studies on e-learning affordances. Uh, at last, our last topic uh, is uh, we call training versus educating teachers. It was interesting be, uh, that we we could see in the focal groups that because there was interaction that some teachers changed their minds and they made references to what others had said. So this teacher in particular, uh, he mentions that. Uh, Another one, Ailton was talking about the courses offered uh, by the Secretary of Education. And then Flavio mentions that he, um, he was really bothered um, about those courses uh, because they focused more on knowing, on teaching them how to do things instead of reflecting on what they could do. So, uh, this part of problematizing situations, uh, this was more like uh, something that was up to the teacher himself. So this also connects to the idea of differentiated learning, which is part of uh, Cope Calenses learning affordances, that we should always uh, work according to specific needs and interests. Um, so in terms of our perspectives for the future, we hope uh, teachers do not feel alone anymore. They have uh, they keep having groups of uh, research groups and teacher education projects in which they can feel um, that they are not alone. And we also hope for a brighter, um, better futures or days ahead. These are some of our references. These are some of our references, and uh, besides the ones which were already present um, in our slides. Thank you very much. Microphone, Valkyria. Uh, my Thank you very much, Karina and Laudu. Uh, it was a very interesting work that you've done. You both have done, okay, with, uh, you know, teacher education. Uh, now, I'd like you to listen to uh, a group of professors, okay? They are all part of our nationwide project uh, on literacies. Uh, they all come from different universities, as I said in the beginning, right? And uh, I, I find uh, this experience uh, of great interest, especially because they have created an online live show called Debatendo as a way to resist the negationism of science that has taken Brazil and probably the whole world or at least the West uh, uh, recently. So their presentation in our symposium or in our colloquium comes in a similar format to that of the show itself so that they have produced a video using the same streaming platform they use regularly for their show called the Batendo. So here it goes. How are you? <laughs> Cheers. How are you? Cheers. 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 Welcome Cheers. To the floor. <laughs> Great to see you. It's Hope wonderful you're all to see well. you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's start then the show. Um, yes. So, welcome you all to this very special show of uh, Debatendo. Um, this is a video presentation, more than a live show, as we usually do, uh, to present the YouTube show that we created in 2020 and um, that, that we called Debatendo, or debating, perhaps in English, which basically means debating at the bar. So the words, this word came up accidentally you know, in a WhatsApp typo when uh, someone included an R in the word debate, 
And we thought it might be a good idea in order to subvert the norm, which was one of the things we wanted to do with the show. Um, and then the word debartendo with an R made, made it explicit, we hoped, how we wanted to connect our academic debates with unpretentious, unpretentious but rich conversations. Like, like those we used to have in the much missed times when we could agglomerate in bars ages ago, it seems. <laughs> so uh, the idea to create this show came from our need for bringing the so-called lay public closer to what we do in our research at the university. Um, so one of our aims with the show was to establish a dialogue between the university and its outside using our voices as academics within applied linguistics. Um, one of our viewers recently mentioned that for her, the show, when I quote, is a much needed way to culturally translate academic discussions so they do not remain inaccessible and limited to our academic bubbles. So um, the Bart ladies, would you all agree that this is one of our main aims with the show? What do you think? I'm going to start, Clarissa. I think, I, sure, right. I certainly agree. Um, I guess we wanted to talk to society uh, without referring to some characteristics of academic discourse that we think have kept pe people apart from science. Uh, characteristics such as name dropping, using difficult and strange words, and also some arrogance that we feel exists in part of this uh, discourse academic discourse, but also, and perhaps mainly, we wanted to bring to university, to the academy, uh, issues that are usually curbed from academic discussions, considered less relevant, irrelevant, but that do cause a lot of impact in society. So for you to have a better idea, we're going to show you some topics that we have debated to give you uh, a picture of the wide range and variety of topics of our show. I hope you like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Lou, you know, something that I think is that uh, besides uh, popularizing science, uh, I think that we also wanted to, to face the challenge of uh, dealing with contemporary topics from, from our perspectives as applied linguists. Uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. maybe shall we now say a few words about how we think we manage with our show uh, to innovate and also to help ourselves and our audience resist the somber times we are living. And um, while we speak, we are going to show you uh, the main authors and theories we have learned from concerning the aspects which were foreground in this presentation, right? So let's start with uh, Simone. Simone, what are yours? Please tell us. Mm, um, well, um, to me, it was very important when I first knew that the students who apply for the high school national exam that we have in Brazil, watch our episodes to get ideas and build possible arguments for their written compositions. And also that high school teachers use our shows as motivational multimodal texts for their classes. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. I think that is, those are really encouraging. And I guess it means that we are helping people in what Paulo Freire called pronouncing the world. That is not only getting adept to the reality, but changing it, especially in the present Brazilian context, there is an urgent need for more people engaged in pronouncing the country to fight for social justice. And I also guess that our debates push the audience to think over their interpretive habits, to comprehend why some truths are taken as so in our daily lives. And uh, um, I will also add just to, to finish my part here, that we somehow help spread the Global South epistemologies in our shows once we frequently ground our discussions in scholars from the Global South. 
I think so. Mm -hmm. Wow. I completely mm -hmm. agree with you. Yeah, sure. Very true, Simone. And, and, and since you mentioned this fight for social justice, I, I think that as university professors and researchers, uh, we do our job always hoping that it can contribute to the construction of a more just world for, for everyone, for all of us, right? And a world where, where we can all coexist peacefully, also with the planet, of course. You know, that's something that we have been talking about a lot recently here in Brazil. So, um, but, you know, guys uh, or ladies, if you prefer, <laughs> since the current government took office, uh, we have been facing attacks on democracy and freedom every single day, as, as you know. So every yeah. day, uh, yeah, the government finds ways to attack Brazilian education and educators, in favor, as we know, of a neoliberal public education dismantling agenda. So I think that when we were already very tired, frustrated, angry, and when we thought that there was there was no way things could get any worse, we saw ourselves in the middle of a pandemic. While our government <laughs> attacks were extended to public health, and they started to put people's lives at risk as we now see you know very you know clearly so i think that at that moment i think ours um was a strong feeling of fear and uncertainty and these feelings led us to a deep feeling of hopelessness so the sensation, uh, putting it in the words of Sousa Santos, was that we had entered the space of hopeless fear. Sousa Santos says that in this space, fear will overweight hope and the world will happen to people in ways that depend very little on them. So what could we do besides writing as academics? So, but who would lead our writings? or maybe to making lives, but who would see our lives besides those who are already in our bubbles? So to mm -hmm. me, ladies, the Barting or the Bartendo gave back hope, which was never and never will be fearless hope, as Sousa Santos calls it, but Freire's concept of hope as the result of action. The Barting, I think, is our way of getting and acting together and when we do that, so it's our way of hoping. So that's what the Barton is for me, our way of hoping. That's it. Yeah. Simone, what do you think? Yeah. Lane. Yeah. Uh, yes. Lane. Yeah, Simone has it. Yeah. Yes. Look, um, tell me. This idea, I was kind of feeling hopeless, if I can say so. So mm -hmm. to me, the Barton came as a gift, as an opportunity for agency in such pandemic times. And I remember once watching um, Homi Baba's live and he was talking about unpreparedness and how this not being prepared leads or may lead to a certain lack of agency. I was like this. It was very difficult for, for me to take action. I was feeling anxious about my role as a university professor. I was even questioning that role, pushing myself as to what I could do or, or what else I could do to contribute to the outside society when it needed the most. So the invitation I received uh, came as a gift, as a relief to that anxiety. I found, I found myself taking action, uh, doing an exercise of citizenship and try to transform my, my local reality. And, and all of this makes me think of what Paulo Freire says about us being unfinished unfinished beings and that for us to be we have to go on being and the the, the bartend or the barting um came to me as a possibility of being continue being um i think we have managed to innovate by tearing down the physical walls of the university classrooms we know that these walls they end up structuring and limiting our ways of thinking being and teaching and when you tear them down i think the way is open to new epistemologies you kind of feel free 
to talk about anything in different ways. Knowledge has no borders, uh, no limits, and I think this is wonderful. I also think that we have yeah. been uh, helping our audience, I guess. And Clarice, I'm also going to quote one of our viewers. She says that the show brings many reflections that take people to other places. And I love this other places because it gives us the idea of movement, displacements, this centering. And I think this is what the Bartendo is all about. Yeah, for sure. What about yeah. you, Clarissa? Well yeah. Um, yeah, I totally agree with, uh, you know, the three of you. But I would like to stress two other mm. elements of the show that I think um have really you know uh contributed to our uh, to what we we've, we've been trying to do in fact so um the first element is um our traditional now traditional pot banging time which is a moment when we announce the end of each episode is near and to announce that we bang our pots and um this is for us i think a sign of protest against the government for sure as Le as lena mentioned it's been really hard to live lately especially under the present federal government in brazil so this pot banging moment has also been a way for us to pour out our hearts and our anger at the situation we're living um, and the second element I want to mention is actually in preparation for each episode. When we produce uh, publicizing videos with some critical questions about the topic of the episode, uh, questions that we uh, try to relate to some images that we select, and also to a big background song or you know a piece of music in order to um, connect these three um, modes of expression and of meaning making um, and we feel that they can help arise the interest of our viewers um, to each episode so um, this is a kind of a multimodal way to promote um, our Freirean conviction that we learn with each other so uh, Freire's idea is that we don't teach anyone people learn with one another in dialogue and um, this is what we want to do. We want to learn by asking questions to ourselves and to our viewers um, in what Freire, more or less what Freire has called the pedagogy of questions. So our show, I think, is based on the importance we give with Freire to a rising curiosity, to asking questions together, and to realizing again with Freire that reading the world precedes reading the word. So this is how we understand our work as applied linguists, dealing with language, with the word, but always in its entanglement with the world. Yeah, so here comes the highlight of the show, the Bart ladies and viewers. Okay. It's pot banging time. I love it. I really do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, me too. I guess this is it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So we're coming to the end of our show. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's mm -hmm. nice to be with you, yes. ladies. Thank you. <laughs> but we still have two seconds to say cheers yeah and thank you sure. very much everyone yeah, <laughs> cheers. thank you for watching us cheers. bye bye <laughs> have a good time take care everyone thank you bye bye, bye, -bye. bye, -bye. your microphone your microphone is off again valkyria Okay, thank you. Always telling me about the microphone. Okay, thank you. So, isn't that an inspiring experience? Okay, these uh, these people had. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clarissa, for bringing this ex for sharing this experience with all of us and all of the viewers as well. So, we look forward now to uh, your comments. Okay, hope that you leave your comments and questions. 
and will be willing to respond to all of you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.